Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today on our second webinar in ISG's uh, 2024 webinar series. Uh, my name is Colin Sisko, a public policy manager at Illinois Soybean. Um, today, we will be talking about the Farm Bill Reauthorization and ARC and PLC with our experts, uh, Tara Smith from Tour Advisory Group, Scott Geralt from ASA, and our presenter, uh, Jonathan Coppice, Professor Jonathan Coppice. Um, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please throw them in the chat. And then after the presentation, um, we will try our best to answer them. Um, a little bit about our presenter, uh, Professor Jonathan Coppice is the Gardner Associate Professor of Agricultural Policy in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's the author of The Fault Lines of Farm Policy, a Legislative and Political History of the Farm Bill, and a member of the Farm Doc Project. Uh, Jonathan previ previously served as Chief Counsel for the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, as well as the Administrator of the Farm Service Agency at USDA. Uh, he grew up on his family's farm in Western Ohio, earned his bachelor's from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and his Juris Doctorate from uh, the George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to you, Professor. Well, thanks, Colin, uh, Corey, and the rest of the Illinois Soybean team for uh, having me on bright and early this morning. Um, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. This is one one heck of a way to celebrate Valentine's by talking uh, talking some Farm Bill. And I appreciate that Scott and Tara are willing to join uh, this discussion as well. So um, I guess buckle up and we'll try to make a little bit of sense out of what is uh, what is difficult to make sense out of right now. So we'll give it a shot and, and obviously questions can help. So I've got a little background stuff to get through um, and we'll try to uh, do this as painlessly as possible. So and I think everybody by this point knows uh, probably the key item to know for all the producers on the line um, that the 2018 Farm Bill, so everything you've lived with the last five years, has been extended for yet another year. So the 2024 decision on your base acres for your farm or farms uh, will be the same as it has been um, since 18, well, since 19, technically. But So your decision right now, uh, coming up on March 15th, is whether or not to enroll those base acres in the Agriculture Risk Coverage or ARC program or the Price Loss Coverage program for that 2024 crop year. And then obviously, if any payments are triggered off of that, uh, we'd see the you'd see those in, in October of 25. And again, as you're familiar with, ARC's got they offer up two options under the ARC uh, umbrella. One is a county level option, which uses the average yields at the county level, or the ARC individual, which uses your individual farm yields, but but across all crop would base on the farm. And again, this is a revenue program, so this is the the five year benchmark history that uh, that sets it up. Uh, history of national prices and county yields, 86% of that is the guarantee. So if, if your actual revenue in the crop year falls below it, below 86% of that five-year history, then, then it triggers a payment. PLC then, the Price Loss Coverage Program, this is a uh, sort of traditional fixed price program. Um, I believe we can uh, we can mark 50 years of this policy with a little, with a little vacation uh, in the late 90s. But here we've got that fixed price in the statute. And if the market year average prices are below that, it, it triggers a deficiency payment. So your choice uh, on your farm is between ARC County and PLC on a crop by crop level, or if you take ARC IC, the individual level, you've got all your base acres enrolled in ARC IC. Uh, the other thing to know with this is obviously uh, the supplemental coverage option is available only under PLC, which is a crop insurance uh, top off at, a, at, a, at an area wide basis. So <clears throat> that's your decision uh, for soybean farmers. Um, you know, I never want to say the decision is easy or uh, or um, I, I don't want to under understate, you know, the, the work to go through it. We've got uh, our calculators and other information on the farm doc website. Um, the the standing advice that we've been you know, providing for years is the same, which is go run the numbers on your farm and get a sense of what it looks like. Um, um, uh-oh, Ms. Pellman, I might have an update problem. Uh, hopefully that hasn't shut off. Okay. Um, run the numbers on your farm and get a sense of it. I think the sort of operational uh, mindset on this is, um, particularly for soybean base, it's going to be really difficult to make PLC pay, uh, just given where the reference prices are. 
And so you see on the screen here, this is using, this is a little bit dated. I haven't had a chance to get the, the latest forecast from CBO in yet, but it's pretty similar. The CBO price forecast is about the same. But what you see are, are a couple key items. One, we've had high prices for soybeans the last few years. Uh, every projection of this is that the soybean prices will remain above the trigger point in PLC. So it's highly unlikely PLC will make any payments on soybean base for the 2024 crop. That has been the experience of PLC for soybean base the entire time this program has been in operation. You've got an 840 reference price built into the statute. The 2018 Farm Bill provided for an effective reference price or escalator provision that would increase uh, that reference price, and that will kick in. That will begin to happen this 2024 crop year. Uh, what we'll see is that soybean reference price will move up to 926 a bushel, um, and uh, that you know, even at that increase, uh, and it's on its way to 966, actually. So that's the maximum the reference price can increase. So we're seeing that built in and locked in uh, already because of the high prices the last couple of years. Um, even with that escalator provision in there, the soybean market year average prices are not projected to be below it, particularly not for 24, even as prices come down. So it's hard to see PLC um, work on soybean base. And again, this is nothing new. Uh, Nick Paulson and, and the rest of us did some work on uh, trying to compare the trigger point prices in uh, PLC and ARC. And so one of the things that he had in an article recently was looking at a, an ARC trigger price about 956 if trend yields uh, hold in the county. So you can kind of see the difference in the two programs. Both of them have that that uh, moving that, that adjustment upward with the high crop prices, but, uh, but PLC is not going to have as much uh going forward so i think that's probably as easy of a decision on soybean base as you're going to find uh, our county is going to look, look a lot better and my my sort of operating thoughts on it is you you, you go in with the assumption our county is the one and see if you can beat it um, but it's going to be hard to do so so what's our look ahead uh for the farm bill well it's not good uh, i hate to start the morning off particularly a valentine's day morning uh with negativity and pessimism but uh well We've got, we've got reasons for negativity and pessimism. Any path forward for the farm bill is going to be uh, difficult at best. So let's try to get a sense of this. Uh, we got really three major problems kind of blocking the path. The first is this reference price issue. There's a demand on, at least in the, in the reported discussions of the farm bill. So uh, a demand from uh, some interest in the farm community to raise reference prices. You know, clearly we see that issue with soybeans, um, the last couple of years of really high prices have diminished payments or zeroed them out for almost everybody, actually. So there's a push to raise preference prices. The problem with this demand is in the way uh, the farm bill, the way the congressional budget process impacts a farm bill. So to raise reference prices, CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, has to project what that will cost. They project that over 10 years into the future, which means we got a whole lot of uncertainty in those projections. But the problem is, is that those projections control the cost estimate, which itself then uh, controls how the budget procedures work, which means you got to offset, you got to offset that projected cost. Now, look, we don't know what the reference price proposal is because there isn't one. I mean, there's been talk of reference price increases, but nobody yet has put out a proposal that says, here's what we want to raise to what levels for which crops. What we do know from trying to, you know, you know, guess at this in the dark is that it's probably a cost structure somewhere between 20 and 50 billion dollars to do so over 10 years. That is an extraordinarily high cost, in part because you have to offset that cost in the process, which means you got to cut something else. Under the budget rules, you have to offset every bit of that and find that savings within the farm bill itself. So you've got really three options. You can cut crop insurance. You could cut SNAP, a supplemental nutrition assistance program that helps low-income families put food on the table, or you can cut conservation. Clearly, if you've ever dealt with any farm bill politics, you know that not a single one of those is a viable option on its own, together, and certainly not for a price tag somewhere between 20 and $50 billion. So this is the number one blocker to a farm bill. I would say this is why we haven't even seen legislation begun, introduced, talked about, uh, leaked, proposed, whatever you want to call it. We haven't seen the first single word of a bill in either the House or Senate committee because this thing is blocking it. I would add that part of the problem, as the soybean uh, example in PLC indicated, 
is that reference prices are going to increase for a majority of the base acres and most of the crops uh, in the programs. So you're going to see a base acre increase because of the 2018 provision that raises it with these recent high prices. Most of those crops. Now, there are three crops that will not, at least three right now, and that is cotton, right, or seed cotton, which uh, the created in 2018, rice and peanuts. Wheat's right on the edge. Uh, the new CBO estimates uh, are showing that maybe wheat won't see the reference price increase either. So this is, gonna, this is what's driving it. The, but again, the cost is astronomical in a farm bill debate. And the prices are increasing anyway. So the second part of this problem is where do you find the offsets? And this leads us into conservation funding and uh, one of many dead ends for a farm bill. So in 2022, Congress uh, passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Inside the Reflation, Inflation Reduction Act was an $18 billion investment, additional funding for conservation, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, ASEP, which is the Agricultural Easement Program, and RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. $18 billion available till 2031, all of that money available to farmers to adopt conservation on their farms. Highly popular uh, nationwide, we're seeing uh, on average, twice as many farmers enroll in these programs, get approved with their applications and still not get the funding. And under the first year of the IRA, we're seeing a similar kind of uh, outcome. Twice as many farmers are approved for funding than there are funds available. So these are incredibly popular. These are direct assistance to farmers to do conservation. So cutting it does not exactly help the politics or the farmer, but that's, Based on rumors in the press, again, we've not seen anything solid on this. Uh, nobody's proposed this directly, but this is uh, has been discussed multiple times as one option to offset uh, the costs of raising reference prices. So, of course, this is going to have real implications on the ground. Like I said, a lot of producers uh, are trying to get this assistance who cannot. I've tried to run some estimates and project out where those funds might go if they're left untouched. Uh, for those of us, you know, those of us in Illinois. Rough projection using historic allocations, we may see close to half a billion uh, over that time frame in conservation assistance. And of course, uh, if you've stood in line and filled out paperwork at NRCS, you know that um, Illinois has struggled under conservation programs and has not seen some of the investments we've seen elsewhere. And so I think this is one that hits particularly hard in this state, uh, particularly as we see things like the nutrient loss reduction challenge and strategy, uh, nutrient loss reduction strategy be challenged in its implementation where we need these investments to help farmers uh, work through those issues. Um, as I said, if you, uh, if you jump on this and look at sort of the history here, you can see uh, in the last five years where, where Illinois has fallen in terms of conservation dollars. Um, excuse me for that. And, you know, one of the things that jumps out at me in particular is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. So this is the Policy Design Lab website we set up at Illinois, where we're trying to work through a variety of different uh, policy issues and, and trying to figure out um, what kind of uh, how we can plug research into this policy better and get some maybe get some innovation and creativity in the programs. Um, but as you can see, over the last five years, Illinois has really lagged and equipped. And so losing this funding would have implications in this state and across the country. So you take those two together. And now this this chart, I'm going to admit, is probably a lot to look at. It's probably a bit much to look at at 7.15 in the morning, um, but give me a second to try to make some sense out of this. So as I said, if you want to raise reference prices, the cost is pretty high. One of the things they're looking to cut is the conservation investments in farming. The other one is SNAP, and we've learned from the last two farm bills that cutting SNAP is a recipe for going nowhere, particularly on the House floor. It's not going to pass the Senate, and it won't be signed by the president, so it's not a recipe for getting the, the bill through the Congress. But I think one of the things we don't talk about enough is this weird dynamic we have. And I know budget discussions are, you know, the kind of thing that puts you back to sleep or make you turn off and walk away. But I think it's important we understand something here. And that is that these problems really compound on each other. So if you take the IRA investments and try to use that for PLC, this is not a one for one trade, right? Part of the challenge is the cost projections by CBO is based on economic modeling of an unknown future. This is not CBO's fault. They're doing the best that I think probably about anybody could with this kind of issue. But what we see is a scenario in which the offset isn't necessarily the same as getting more payments or more assistance to farmers. 
In fact, running some analysis on this and really about driving myself crazy trying to understand it, I'm worried that most of the money, if it's used as an offset, will never make its way to a farmer. Here's one of the reasons why. So if you look at the lines on this, gar on this chart, the lines compared to the, the area, the pinkish area, what this is, are the, is the percentage of the market year average price as projected by CBO compared to the effective reference price or the trigger point for a payment. Why this matters is in reality, at those price levels, there would not be a payment if it's above this, this area. But in the CBO scoring process, we're showing billions of payments in years in which these crops would not receive a payment. So what, I, what I'm trying to make sense of out of here is that that the, that the offset process is taking money that farmers would receive for conservation and using it to sort of pay this economic modeling uh, process rather than actually going to farms. So there's a very good chance that the cost of raising reference prices would not result in more payments under those reference prices, but would require the conservation investments to cover that estimated cost. Soybeans is a great example. If you look at the brown dotted line up here, soybeans never get anywhere near triggering a payment in the CBO projections. But CBO has hundreds of millions of dollars in projected outlays for soybeans, just under PLC. And the reason is that they've got to sort of build in the uncertainty. And so there's always a chance that there may be a low price scenario that triggers a payment and that gets factored in. Corn is even worse. There's a couple years in which corn looks like it'll fall below the, the trigger point, triggering well over $2 billion in payments possibly under PLC, but for many years within this 10 year projection, it's not. However, for an offset, you gotta cover that projected cost. There wouldn't be payments, but you gotta pay for it up front. There's no way to know. So I think this is a real risk and it creates, it sort of compounds and magnifies the political problems of finding offsets to do this. And so I think it's important that we understand that, that this really could, um, result in a loss, not just of conservation funding, but in assistance directly to farmers and not really reward, not really come out with much on the other end. It's it's a pretty big gamble. Here's just corn and soybeans alone. So it's a little less uh, confusing for the blurry eye this morning. Uh, it was Fat Tuesday yesterday. So I understand that this, this may be particularly uh, painful discussion. Um, but you can see again, how many years corn is triggering projected costs, but would not trigger a payment if the projected price were the actual mark your average price. So hopefully there's a little bit of clarity on that. Our final problem, of course, is the United States Congress. And any of us who've spent any time paying any attention to this, well, I feel your pain. Uh, we knew coming in this was going to be a difficult Congress with tight vote margins in both, both the House and the Senate. Um, the House majority is down. Actually, I think it's lower than that now. The, the George Santos was removed and a Democrat just won his special election for that seat. So that changes this majority, maybe down to like one vote majority at, bo at most. I think the bottom line of what we're seeing in the House is that there's not a functioning majority, that in fact, a small faction within the Republican caucus can pretty much control or dictate what goes on or more likely what doesn't go on. So the reason this matters, obviously, that it, it's blocking up a whole lot of things, whether that's funding the federal government, whether that's dealing with the war in Ukraine, on and on and on. But for a farm bill in particular, what we have seen is that partisan fights over things like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program just blow apart the coalition and, and, and eliminate the vote counts you need to get across the House floor. Most of the people in the Congress who do not want to vote for any of this spending, any of these provisions who are most adamant about SNAP are also going to want to cut everything else in a farm bill. So getting their votes from no to yes is really, really difficult. This means that a partisan farm bill has is incredibly vulnerable on the House floor. In fact, I don't know how they pass a partisan farm bill on the House floor, but even if they did, it has no chance in the Senate and it won't be signed by the president. So if this farm bill, if they actually get started, they get over this price increase for PLC, and they do so by cutting SNAP and conservation. They've created a partisan farm bill, which honestly is not a plan for success. This is a great concern if, if this is the path we're going down. Um, obviously, bipartisan legislation also doesn't seem to have a lot of favor in the House, so I'm not sure what the solution is there. And I'm sure Tara and Scott maybe have some better perspective on this, and maybe I'm just too grumpy in the morning. I think this could possibly get worse uh, when CBO does produce the official new baseline, depending on where they think prices are going, or the, the February update 
raises uh, some questions with this and still trying to sort out kind of where those price projections might go. But the other reality is we all know that this is an election year and nothing's going to get done. Um, and even the things they're working on are highly complicated. If you need an example, this Ukraine funding bill and the border security negotiations in the Senate give us plenty of reason uh, for frustration and concern. So the path, the legislative path is extraordinarily difficult in 2024. All right. So I want to be clear. This is not me making a prediction or prognostication on how what the farm bill process looks like or whether it gets done. I've highlighted the if. This is the giant if. If there is any path for a farm bill in the 118th Congress, it probably looks a little bit something like this. I am not at all saying there's a path. Uh, if my pessimism has not been clear enough, I'm sure I'm sure we can clear that up with questions. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it's February 14th. We're halfway through the month and nothing's happened. Uh, at this point, um, the, how, or the Senate passed a Ukraine and Israel and other support bill. It is uh, waiting on whether the House is going to do anything. Uh, the House Speaker said that they won't even take it up. So that doesn't look good. So it doesn't appear as though um, February is going to provide much of a chance. If we move on into March... We've got a huge blocker in the first two weeks of March. On the 1st and the 8th, the continuing extension of the continuing resolution. Yeah, you heard that right. A continued ex a continued extension of a continuing resolution. In other words, we haven't funded the federal government for fiscal year 2024, which we're rapidly approaching halfway through. Uh, we've done this simply on just continuing the funding from the year before under you know what's uh, uh, acronym the CR. That was extended in February to March 1st and 8th. So nothing's going to happen until at least March 8th, at least getting these funding issues done. And honestly, we haven't seen much movement in the appropriation side to have any confidence that um, we're going to get a full year appropriation. But if they get something done by the 8th, and that means uh, not just um, something, like they've got to either extend it or we go into shutdown. If they get something done, whether that's a further extension or an actual full year appropriations, then we can probably see the House Ag Committee uh, have, have a shot or it needs to take its shot to move. Uh, that's probably setting us up for a new CBO baseline in April, May, which could complicate the issues, as I mentioned. The House Ag Committee, I mean, if we haven't moved in March, they better be moving in May. Um, whether they even try the floor or not is a huge set of questions, as we just talked about. But that's kind of the April-May time frame. Uh, if they get moving, maybe that uh, we get some progress on the Senate side. Obviously, this could flip. The Senate could move first. Um, uh, so it's not necessarily in order. Um, but one or both of them probably need to make some real progress in the April-May time frame. I think June is the last chance. If we haven't seen any progress uh, in June, by the end of June, then I, we can, I think we're all talking another extension and maybe a multi-year extension at that point. That's because from July to November, we're going from the, can, the conventions for the presidential through the election, and there simply is not an opportunity to get anything done, particularly nothing as complex as a thousand pages of legislative text and about a trillion four in projected spending. The reason these time frames are important is we need to get something moved just far enough, right? There needs to be legislation on the actual calendar and table so that at the very least, at the last sort of option here is that after the election, there's the potential for a lame duck session in Congress, but you need to have gotten far enough along at least to have a, a viable product, legislative product to negotiate in a sort of quasi conference situation to produce a lame duck outcome. Even as I say that, I, I nearly feel uh, crazy uh, putting that up because this is this is beyond difficult. So I am not uh, very optimistic on our path, but it's there if they can get moving. And I think that's the key thing we need to see in a very short amount of time is some real progress at the committee level, uh, some real movement towards whatever this projection, whatever these, these reference price discussion issues are, what the offsets look like. Um, I think it's upon those who are pushing for that to tell us what they want, to make it clear to the public so it can be analyzed and understood. Um, but until that happens, there's no chance for a farm bill. And as I said, the calendar is getting the window, the legislative window is uh, closing rapidly uh, and it's going to be tough to move things. So I apologize to end on that sort of downer note. Um, <laughs> I need to come up with like an optimistic uh, component of this, but 
that's my best that's my best uh shot at understanding where we're at and what what it may look like it's a it's a tough path ahead so Colin, uh, again, sorry to be, uh, you know, uh, a bit of a downer first thing in the morning, but <laughs> that's what we got. I'll stop sharing and bring us all back into discussion. Maybe Tara and Scott have like some happy, uh, happy thoughts, and better news for us. But thank you all for sitting through that. And again, to the Illinois Soybean Association, thanks for having me on. Uh, happy to happy to discuss further and take questions. Yeah, I think uh, before we go into questions, maybe uh, Tara Scott, Tara Scott Tara, Tara. Um, see what you guys see what uh, think, have any uh, thoughts on ARC PLC, Farm Bill Reauthorization, things like that. Well, it's a pleasure to join you all today and to be on the panel with these uh, folks. Um, I have uh, Jonathan's book at home, actually. So, you know, I he's he's well known and so is Tara and respected. Um, so yeah, I, I, I he did a great job of outlining the challenges of getting a farm bill done. I mean, we, we are hopeful. Um, we would really like to see that get done this year. Um, it needs to get done. There's changes that need to be made. Um, but but as outlined, there there are challenges. Um, work is continuing behind the scenes. Uh, ASA's president is in town right now, actually meeting, uh, having meetings on the Hill. Um, and so, so we continue to work and engage with, um, uh, with the Hill on, on these issues. Um, you know, on CBO's new baseline, um, I've largely seen that as a positive, um, given, so CBO had some pressure in their last baseline for prices being too low. Uh, we've seen them bring up some of those prices, particularly in soybeans. And so increasing the reference price under the new baseline should be cheaper than it would have been last using last baseline. Now, as Jonathan said, um, it's not quite clear if this will be a scoring baseline. I mean, the budget committee has to decide that or if we need to wait. But I think CBO has been moving in the direction of making some of the changes a little bit cheaper than they would have been uh, under the previous baseline. Um, and, and there, I will point out there are more than one, there's more than one way to make some changes to reference prices. Um, uh, I certainly hope we can make some changes for less than 50 billion. Um, you know, I, I think you could approach 30 billion fast, but I think there's ways to do it even cheaper than that. Um, you know, we can change the, what's called the statutory reference price. So the $8 and 40 cents that's established in legislation that goes back to 2014. Um, uh, you know, that's one method is to change that. The other is with the effective reference prices, as, as Jonathan was talking about, um, as he, as he correctly pointed out right now, that is capped at $9 and 60 cents. Nine dollars and sixty six cents per bushel. Um, that's I, I would say that's an arbitrary cap. Um, you know, it's based off of budgetary measures that you can't exceed fifteen percent above the um, statutory reference price. And so um, that being kind of arbitrary, I, it's it's still kind of is a hindrance. So the things you can do, such as increasing that cap or removing it, you also have to have uh, or take eighty five percent of the moving average price. You know, you could increase that threshold to 90% or more. And those are some cheaper ways, and they would allow reference prices to move um, going forward. And then part of the reason that's also important is we keep on, to some degrees, having this fight every four or five years about reference prices. And a large part of that is because they are they have been fixed in legislation. So as we've seen farm prices go up, those reference prices start to become irrelevant at those new price levels. If we can let those float more, that takes off some of the pressure in future years that farm prices can continue to build baseline in future farm bills. And we don't have to keep on coming back to the table and finding new offsets every time. Um, so, the, so ASA has not endorsed a particular route, you know, effective reference price or statutory, um, but there are options and, and some would provide benefits down the road. Um, so I will quit there and uh, turn it over to Tara. And I'll be really quick here because I see our good friend Lynn Corzine already has a couple questions teed up um, for folks on, on SEO. Um, I think I want to make a little bit finer point and maybe even be more negative than Jonathan Kappas, if that's possible, um, about the ability of Congress to function here. I think he called a partisan farm bill vulnerable on the House floor. I would just say it's not possible, um, flat out. Um, we've gone back and looked at the votes from the last few farm bills. We've never lost fewer than 20 Republicans um, on a farm bill vote on the House floor, even when they've passed. Um, 
this Congress is not going to be any different. Um, so if you're not going to lose fewer than 20 votes or for, fewer than 20 Republicans and you only have two votes to spare, it's not hard math to know that is not a path forward for success. Um, and so I think the House floor would be a, a pretty poor exercise with a with a partisan farm bill um, if we were to go through it. And, and quite frankly, politically would put a lot of frontline members in both parties in a really bad place in terms of having to take some really ugly votes on the House floor on a farm bill. Um, and I know we've heard a lot of folks talk about a lame duck farm bill. Well, we'll just get this done in a lame duck after the after the election. And I don't disagree that it, it it's it's possible, but you can't just write a farm bill in six weeks out of nowhere. There has to be something to start with. You have to mark up a bill in committee. You have to have text. It has to have gone through some sort of process before you can mirac miraculously appear a thousand page bill in a lame duck session. So I would just stress that while lame duck is a possibility, it, it can't just come out of nowhere. Uh, we have to have accomplished something in that time frame that Jonathan mentioned earlier. Um, and I really appreciate Scott's comments on the baseline. I'd love to chat more offline about baseline numbers. I will say, um, as a big fan of crop insurance, one of the things that did strike me about that is that increase in prices that helps on reference prices also increased the price tag for crop insurance very significantly. Um, and I think my only concern there is, does that make crop insurance a bigger target? for those looking to cut money from somewhere else? Do we suddenly become the bank if all of the other banks are taken off of the table? Um, so with that, I'd love to talk about SEO, but I'll let others jump in and, and talk about some of Len's questions first. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, so I'll go to that. Uh, and Jonathan, I'll start with you, I guess. Um, so. There's a question about uh, is there enough chance of SCO kicking in that we should that a farmer should consider PLC? But I uh, SCO is an interesting. Um, so let's look at it just from from a soybean standpoint. If you're buying up 85 percent coverage uh, in your underlying coverage, right? SCO is going to give you one point, 86 percent. Is it worth it to go that on a reference price that's not going to trigger any time in any sort of foreseeable future? Again, I don't know that I see that as a as a straightforward trade off. But each farm, I think you got to run this. I think you got to run the estimates for yourself and kind of see where your you know where's your crop insurance provision or where's your crop insurance underlying coverage stop. What kind of you know potential does this have? But it does. I mean, to be clear, it. I don't want to leave the impression that the PLC Art County choice is simply that the, the SEO component with PLC is a factor to to plug into it. It's an area-wide insurance coverage top off to your underlying policy. So in that way, it has some similarities to ARC, but you're coming in with the, you know, with the, the crop insurance pricing mechanism and the area-wide yield loss. So for soybean base, it's just tough to see that uh, necessarily equal out ARC County where things look like they're headed. But I do not... Uh, I don't, I don't want to anger Tara too much. I just, I don't see it on a soybean base, but I do, I do think that's an important thing for farmers to run through and consider the, the, the impacts that another point or two uh, of SEO coverage might have uh, as they, as they manage through what could be a challenging year. If I could jump in and add just a bit more there. Um, yeah. I, I think you always need to look at these things individually. Um, uh, some of the challenges have been um, is that, is essentially SEO is tied to Title One. I. I mean, that's not something we've really seen much before. And and they're but they're paid on different things: base acres for ARC and planted acres for SEO. Um, and so we have this weird interaction right now where we have a little over fifty million base acres nationally of soy, and we have close to 90, 85, 90 million acres of planted. And so if you choose PLC on those fifty plus million base million base acres. You have nearly 90 million acres in, uh, ineligible for this crop insurance program. Um, and so, you know, nationally, we've had low participation rates for SEO. Um, for soybeans in 2023, is a little over 6% because of this. Um, 
And so you're up with ARC, you're giving up a free program. SEO does cost something. Um, so SEO is a, is a good program. Um, it, and you should definitely look at that and, and consider it. But um, I, I do think there for soybeans, there are some real challenges in that interaction um, that, you know, kind of getting into the next farm bill that we would love to see changed um, through some different mechanisms to make more soybean producers eligible for it. Yeah, um, full disclosure. So SEO was a Pat Roberts um, baby when I was on committee. So we sort of shepherded that language through. Um, so I might be a little bit partial here, but I think the reason that uh, Chairman Roberts really wanted to create that program and include it in statute was because um, he wanted to be sure that farmers were going to have options and that farmers who might be more comfortable on a crop insurance playing field versus a Title I playing field had that option moving forward. Now, the way he drafted it, you didn't have to make a choice between ARC and SEO. Um, those were meant to be two separate things. The reason why we're seeing so many proposals out there right now to increase that premium discount um, for SEO and to really bring it on par with what cotton has available to them now in stacks. Um, because we're seeing the benefits of Title I for soybeans um, really be minimized. And crop insurance has become the primary risk management tool for soybean growers. And so is there a way to make that an even better risk management tool if uh, proposals to, to improve Title I because of all of the budget challenges and other things that Papas and, and Scott have talked about um, don't pan out? So I think it's going to be an interesting year talking about SEO and the numbers there. You went off mute, Jonathan, so I'll let you. Looking for the questions. Do we have another one to go through? No, we'll, I'll wait for some more. But I do have a question that I uh, want to yeah. see your perspectives on. Um, so we've seen the news that Debbie Stabenow has uh, her proposal on increased uh, crop insurance premiums but you couldn't use any ARC PLC. So just kind of what are your immediate thoughts on that? I guess likelihood of it and just kind of uh, how that would affect our Illinois soybean growers. I like to know, I, I like it when you know you're being set up to get yourself in trouble. And so this is, this is, uh, this is walking into it eyes wide open. Um, so let me, let me say two things off the top from that. So the first thing I want to say is, um, I mean, look, I worked for Chairwoman Sabinow way back in the long ago time. Uh, so I have a lot of respect for, for what uh, she does and how she legislates and what she works through. And I say that because what I see this proposal is, um, is an important attempt to move the negotiations. So I, I don't, I think sometimes we get really stuck in like, if we say one thing, you know, You've you've excluded everything else, and this is the only way to, that they, that that goes. I I interpret that her letter and this proposal as number one, we're not getting negotiations moving, and something has to do. So we've got to get this discussion going. So I see it as a good faith attempt to to try to jumpstart a negotiation. I think it's an interesting concept around, and Tara made this point too. Farmers want options. I actually think. Uh, we, we've gotten way too wrapped around the axle of this one size fits all. Let's raise the statutory reference price and hope that, you know, that that solves all these issues. Whereas I think farmers particularly have, uh, they have a lot of options in crop insurance. They know how to manage risk. And I think providing them these options and, and sort of some alternatives as, as they sort of figure out what it looks like on their farm, and what makes sense. I think that's, you know, probably in the right direction for the longer term. Um you know whether it's the direct trade off or some version of that again i don't i don't know where the details and how it looks but i think it's it's more than anything a chance or an, an attempt to jump start some negotiations and move this thing off of this kind of uh i mean it's not even a stalemate because we haven't started and so at the very least um she's put this on the table to open a discussion you know it's it's you know a negotiation requires at least two parties to have uh, things on the table to discuss. And until we see that, you know, it's kind of uh, it's kind of difficult to work it out. So, you know, I, I don't want to 
I don't want to get too lost on the specifics of it because I don't, well, one, there aren't a lot of specifics of it. How that would look and work is still in need of, of a lot of analysis and detail, beginning with the cost structure from CBO. So I, I read it or interpret it very much as let's move this negotiation. Let's get this thing started. Bring bring the ideas to the table. Tara and I uh, worked on opposite sides of those tables for a few years. And, and you know, that's how we work, right? We, we brought ideas and sometimes she didn't like ours and sometimes we didn't like their ideas, but you get them out there and you get a good faith discussion. And I think Scott was right. There's a lot of work that's been going on behind the scenes and staff have done incredible amounts of work, but, but we've got to see that kind of level of, of, of real open negotiation, real sort of proposals coming forward and working them out. And if we don't get that, our window to do so closes rapidly. And I think that's the other side of this. And so I, like I said, I commend her for for trying to push the discussion, for trying to get the negotiation started. Um, I wouldn't, you know, latch on to any one specific thing at this point uh, as as an absolute, you know, must have or not do or that sort of thing. I think again, it's just an attempt to to move uh, move things forward. Yeah, it's been interesting. And Scott, you, I'm sure you guys are running numbers on what that kind of proposal would would look like, but I think. We've seen a lot of radio silence from a lot of the farm groups, quite frankly, on that proposal to date, because that's a lot to swallow. And that requires, I think, a lot of analysis for folks to really start to wrap their head around. And that's just going to take some time for folks um, in the countryside and, again, the farm organizations to really to run that analysis Um and see what that would even even look like, because it's very different than where we've been on farm policy in the past. Um, and so I think folks are treading carefully, I guess, as they approach that proposal and how to respond to it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, Tara, treading carefully. I mean, um, I think at this point with, with proposals and and so we haven't, we have not officially um, endorsed or um uh, went against this you know we we just remain in discussions at this point I, um i will just throw a few things you know that have to be considered and this is going back to the seo point tying title one and crop insurance together i mean they're fundamentally supposed to cover different risks um you know crop insurance is supposed to cover your your growing risk uh, within the season whereas title one is covering a longer supposed to cover a longer term risk um so can you really trade off one versus the other and if you make if you further tie those together, does it become harder to defend having both programs too? Um, and um, I think the other thing we've generally seen if farmers have a choice between a program where they don't have to pay out of pocket and one where they do, they almost always prefer the one that doesn't have an out of pocket cost. Um, you know, we, we've seen some of this before with cotton and, and some of the stacks program and how that initially went um, it, and Congress kind of had to come back to the table and find the title one program for them. Um, so again, ha we, we have not taken an official stance on this, but I think there, there are considerations definitely as we move forward talking about it. Um, going back to the SCO conversation, uh, Leon had kind of a clarifying question. Um, so he means using lower percent crop insurance and then topping SCO off to save money. So I guess kind of what are your thoughts with that? I would have to sit down and, and run it for next year. I have not done that. Um, and, and there's also on farm considerations. I mean, right, SEO and ARC are both county level. So it's going to be very specific. I mean, in general, that's not a bad strategy, um, but it really just depends on the relative likelihood of SEO versus um, ARC paying. Uh, but yeah, I mean, since SEO does a have a higher uh, subsidy rate than, than your individual policy, I mean, in general, if, if, you, if you're eligible for SEO, yeah, that's that's a good strategy to save some money if you're willing to ha to have the trigger at the county level instead of your farm. Yeah, I I think that's the big question with it. You're you're trading if you're at eighty five percent on your underlying coverage, right? You're trading down that that individual yield loss trigger, uh, the underlying coverage for that county area trigger. So I think that's always the big part of it. But uh, you know. I'm not an economist, so I don't. I won't. Uh, I won't do the math. <laughs> I want to sort of add a, a point I made, which I think is a good one, which is a, the challenge around this 
this interaction between Title I base acre program payments and crop insurance. And I think it's a really important point for this discussion and one that does need, you know, to be dug into further um, because it is a very different setup. And soybeans, and I really, I made note of that. Your point about the soybean with, with such a small base acres number compared to what's planted, you know, we're well, almost 30 million acres short in soybeans, what, what's planted to base. Now that obviously also leads into the discussion about updating base and trying to do all those things, which is also expensive and problematic. But, but I think there's a really important part of that, um, which is why I kind of come back to my point, like this, let's get this negotiation started then and start working those things out because that is a really, that is really key. Thank you for the to have them operate. Um, yeah, you read my mind, Jonathan. I was going to ask a question about about base acres at some point. So you're you're <laughs> we're on the same page this morning. Um, well, I wanted to make sure Tara would would address that question. She loves base acres. That's, that's Tara and I have talked topic. about it. So. <laughs> um, but Rob has a question. Um, so a two part question. Does so and you kind of alluded to it, Jonathan? But does a five year farm bill get passed before the next Congress? But also with that, how hard is another extension? If we need, need to get to that point in September, how hard do you think that'll be, that process will be uh, towards the end of September of this year? Now, Rob should know better than to hit me with a difficult question this early in the morning. Now, I, of all people, I would think you would know better than that. Uh, as we went over, it's tough to see a farm bill get through. Uh, it, it, the, the challenges are immense. So we are... I mean, nobody wants to really uh, talk about it, but I think we are in this this extension. It's you know, it's on the table. Uh, to Sarah, to Tara's point from earlier, um, you're not going to just create a whole farm bill in a lame duck process, but you can do an extension in a lame duck situation. So, given the state of things, I would look. Well, it, I would expect a busy lame duck, and this is probably one of the things that has to be dealt with. I think the bigger question right now is, uh, given the state of our uh, congressional challenges and politics and the unknowns of what's going to happen in November or after, um, there's a part of me that wonders why, uh, you know, particularly with this escalator provision in there and and uh, and all the pieces we've got and have lived with this this last few years, that is it uh, is it better to to push this further out and maybe look at a multi year extension and not get caught up in this kind of CR type lifestyle where we just constantly kick the can a little bit down the road? I mean, if you know, there's a part of me that thinks if you're going to kick the can down the road, kick it for a while and start sorting out a lot of these very complex issues and and sort of embrace the reality that Congress right now is not in a position to do complex legislation, and I don't know that it gets better. Uh, in in the next Congress, and so um, I know that's a very unpopular thought and opinion. Uh, nearly throws and and Scott probably uh, didn't like it either. So I I want to make sure neither of them are associated with that comment. But I think it's something that begins to at least uh, register in my mind that that you know how much how much of a of a constant extension game do we want to get stuck in um, and unable to really work on this now. Maybe the elections provide some form of clarity that we're lacking at the moment, but um, I'm also not optimistic. So we're in a tough spot. Yeah, I mean, Rob, I think it's just going to be tough to get a bill done this year. And I think everybody hesitates to kind of say that because we don't want to um, – undermine confidence in the great leadership that we have in the four corners of the House and Senate Ag Committee, right? Nobody wants to um, say that that they're not fantastic and aren't doing the work and, and um, aren't trying to get it across the finish line. I just think that they're facing a lot of headwinds and it's going to be really difficult to get a bill across the finish line this year. And that's just the reality of the situation and it's not created by them. Um, I think it's important to remember that if we have to kick the can to 25, and I'm not saying we need a multi-year extension, which I think is very doable in a lame duck session. So just to be clear, I'm not saying that's the direction we should go, but it's really important to remember that that's a new Congress. And we don't just 
pick up where we left off. If there are bills that have been introduced, if there um, is a markup that's been done, too bad, so sad. You know, we've got to start over um, with the new Congress. We're going to have new committees. We could have new leadership in committee. We will have new leadership in committees with uh, Chairwoman Stabenow's retirement. And there's going to be, you know, time to organize a new Congress. They're going to want to have some new hearings. Um, the process isn't going to be quick start. Um, we're going to see some drag in having to start over, I guess, in 2025. And so folks should just be aware of that. And I think that's only more so if we see a change in who has the gavel in the House or the Senate. So. I don't know, Scott, if you have any perspective you uh, want to echo, but. Uh, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretend, you know, uh, policy person here. I'm, a, I'm an economist. So, uh, no, I, I, uh, I mean, what they are all a correct. real one coppice. <laughs> um, no, it's, there are definitely challenges. I mean, we don't want to take the foot off the pedal and, you know, give an out for Congress but we, we fully realize there are challenges to getting things done. Um, and I will just say, you know, um, for Rob, um, Rob always gives me a hard time for not wearing a tie. I've even received a text during this call. So I'm just going to call you back out there, Rob. Oh, uh, has there ever been um, more than one year extension on a farm bill? I mean, Terry, you kind of said no one wants to be underbind. So I think that would be tough, but. No. We've done weeks long extensions of the farm bill back in 07, 08. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, professor. There has not been a multi-year farm bill extension, uh, at least not in any modern, when we're in the modern sort of congressional state. Tara's right, we've, we've you know, the 2014 farm bill had to extend, be extended multiple times to get it through. And I do want to, I do want to side with Scott on this is we don't want to, you don't want to discourage it it is not a good option by any stretch of the imagination. It is, uh, this is sort of like uh, what grandpa always used to say, you know, you, you expect the worst and just be happy when it doesn't pan out, right? You expect that you plan for it and you sort of have it in the back back pocket as this is a possibility, but it would be unprecedented and it would, and it would, uh, it would be unusual and unprecedented. But I mean, that also describes our current Congress and state of politics. And so part of me, and this is, you know, why I can say this and neither one of the other two have to uh, have to be part of, part of me is concerned. We're not in, and we may not even be in it after this election, in a situation in which working out such complex, humongous legislation with the number of decisions and moving pieces, you know, we're, we're far from that right now. And so unless there's more clarity in the November uh, we see both chambers flip and we see a whole lot of change coming out of that. And so starting over is going to be difficult. Um, so that's why I say it. I'm not trying to be, you know, difficult on this. I just, it, it, it strikes me as one of those things that should be thought through that if, if we can't, if Congress can't get this done, then is it better to have that longer term certainty and allow this, whatever's going on right now, maybe to work itself out and give time to get, to get through it or past it. But I, I do, I, I want to recognize that that's not, that's not usual. That that's not happened before. Um, and it would be, it would be a very different uh, uh, situation. Um, so it's not a, it is not a great option by any stretch of the imagination. But you're right. We're already in unprecedented times. You know, we've done extensions a million times before, but to the best I could find, we've never missed a deadline for a farm bill without at least marking up a bill. Um, and that's and that's a key point, Tara. Thank you for clarifying. Like when we've extended in the past, one or both committees have moved. I mean, how the fourteen farm bill had passed the Senate twice before the House voted it down. The House Ag Committee had produced legislation both times with the floor, you know. If you go back 2012, House leadership refused to take it up. Then in 2013, they passed again out of the committee. The Senate again passed it with a bipartisan vote. 
and then they defeated it on the House floor. So we actually had legislation that was moving and it was it was, um, you know, the, the the key details, the weeds of this mess are all done at the committee level. Right. You're not going to get really detailed policy changes on, on either floor. It's likely a hatchet job on things that you typically see come up in amendment kind of strategy. So that that part is key. And that's why I keep stressing this this aspect. that We've not even seen proposals on the table in either committee. And that's what concerns me. That is unprecedented to try to get something moving without anything more than, frankly, Chairwoman Stabenow's uh, letter. And so we got to see that. That's that's where the, the process really has to begin. Um, in that negotiation, because you've got to have a product to work with, and that requires the consideration by the committees. I will say we are uh, reaching uh, our time. Um, we've had uh, a lot of pessimism this morning, so I just want to see if you guys have any optimistic things to leave our farmers with before we get off today. Do I try first, or Tara, Scott, you want to be you want to be optimist first? <laughs> You know what I see as optimistic, uh, believe it or not, is around these conservation investments. I think it's it's absolutely phenomenal and a phenomenal statement that producers are lining up to get funding to help do conservation on their ground. I mean, this is an investment in your fields, your farm, the future of that farm and, and what what's there. And so I do think that there's a positive there. And I actually... Um, I would argue that that's maybe where we should be looking more and more to understand how we can help farmers in that space manage the risks. I mean, we never talk about managing risks with conservation. So I think there's a real positive there. And I think, you know, maybe we can talk conservation a bit more and think it through uh, as a way to get around some of these current blocks and obstacles. So if I'm optimistic, I look at that. I look at what that investment's doing uh, for water and soil and those sort of things and kind of would like to see a lot more of it. I will say, I think on my optimism, I will say that a lot of times in DC, it is not unusual for you to sort of have to hit rock bottom on any sort of piece of legislation or negotiation before things kind of come back together and you you get some movement. And so um, if there's any optimism in, in the fact that we're seeing this pretty snarly um, in the press tit for tat going on right now, um, maybe that's the sign that we've sort of hit the bottom and we're now going to um, build up from, from there. So is that fair? Fabus is laughing at me, so. So the, I think the glass half full take is that I haven't seen, we haven't seen any serious proposals to cut farm bill funding, or at least that I'm aware of. I mean, the discussion is about how you find offsets to pay for new things, right? I, I think there's a general consensus, more needs to be done. And, and the discussion is around how do we pay for that? So, I mean, that that is definitely a glass half full um, take on this is, you know, we're just trying to figure out how to improve it, not how to limit damage. 